Welcome to another episode of One on One with Miss LaFauna. Joining me this week from the band Striper, it is singer Michael Sweet. We talk about his new solo album, One Sided War, and we in fact do a track by track, including the Japanese bonus track. We also touch upon Striper's 30th anniversary tour of To Hell with the Devil. Before checking out Michael, please check me out on Twitter at Mitch Lafon, M I T C H L I F O N, and on Facebook, one on one, Mitch Lafon. And with that, here is the one, the only, Michael Sweet. We are speaking with Michael Sweet of Striper, but also Michael Sweet Solo, the new album One Sided War. Good day, Michael. Always, always a pleasure. Thank you, my friend. People listening right now are probably saying, oh, dear God, no, not another interview with Michael Sweet. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we seem to do these every couple of months, and, uh, you know, that's fine with me. I, there is so much in the history to, uh, to dig up, but um, I don't know. Why don't, why, don't, why don't we look at one-sided war in, in full today? That, that I think, okay. is, a, is a nice thing to do. First of all, uh, I got to hear the album. It comes out August 26, um, a day before my birthday, which is smart because people are busy on my birthday. They don't have time for new albums. Um, and you know, it was planned, it was planned that way to <laughs> right. come out the day before your birthday. Right. In fact, a great <laughs> gift for, for that. But uh, when I heard it and I listened last night and I listened this morning, the thing that strikes me is – I don't even know how to put this. I mean it's like – a heavy metal Michael Sweet album in the sense that it, the, the guitars are just cranked and, and excuse the, the spinal tap reference, but they're cranked to 11, right? I mean, <laughs> you're, you're just, you're bla blazing on this. It's like Zach Wilde came out of you and, and, uh, you know, so let, let's talk about that. Let, let's talk about the sound. Why not sort of a, you know, ballad, heavy, sappy album? Why, why this guitar attack? Well, you know, it, it, there's a number of reasons. I I have a heavy side, and I have a light side. You know, I grew up with bands uh, from Iron Maiden and Judas Priest to Journey. So, you know, I appreciate all types of music, and I just appreciate the song. So that being said, because I have many sides musically, I like to show those sides. And, uh, you know, in the past, uh, in terms of solo albums, I've showed the lighter side. Uh, at times, I've shown the heavy side because uh, I mix in a song like "Save Me" with, you know, a ballad like "How to Live" or, or what have you. Uh, on this album, I really wanted to focus on the heavier side. There are still songs that are more straight ahead rock and roll, like you know, you know, uh, one one way and um, one way up, excuse me, um, which is a little more ACDC ish. And, uh, you know, songs like One Sided War, and then you have the songs like I Am and Bizarre and uh, Golden Age that are just straight ahead metal. Um, and I got kind of tired of people, you know, I've heard the comment thousands of times uh, with a sneer from people saying, oh, yeah, you know, it's not as heavy as Striper, you know, or it doesn't have the balls that Striper has, or it doesn't kick you like Striper, or blah, 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 blah. So I just wanted to kind of put an end to those comments with this album. And and that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Right. And, and you know, listening to this, and you mentioned Striper, why not put the Striper brand name on it? Because it it does rock and it do, it, it is heavy. Why not just say, hey, guys, let's get in the studio. I've got these songs. I've got this vision. And just do it as a Striper album. Well, I'll tell you why. Uh, you know, um, that would mean that we'd be putting out two or three albums a year. And that doesn't necessarily work in terms of uh, marketing and promoting. You know, there is a, bands can certainly oversaturate themselves uh, with albums and with shows. You know, when you go to markets twice in a year, it doesn't always work. So, and, and what I mean by that, to start off, I should have said, I have songs coming out of me constantly, almost to the point where it makes me nuts. Um, there, there's always a song in my head and, uh, an overflow of material. And we certainly could do that. I certainly could have said, uh, okay, guys, let's go do another Striper album. But again, we just released Fallen not that long ago. And, you know, the other side of that coin, what I would like to add is, uh, it's kind of nice, nothing against the guys. I love them 
dearly. But it's kind of nice to step outside of the striper camp and do things on my own. It's it's a, a, a recharge for me and it, it kind of a breath of fresh air and a way for me to take a deep breath and clear my mind from all things striper and just go have some fun and do, do something on my own with other players. I can bring in other guys and, uh, you know, again, nothing, no disrespect to the striper guys. Uh, but you know, it, that's, that's why I do it. Uh, you know, I've joked about this. I'm ADHD and OCD and that applies to my musical life. Um, I hyper-focus on stuff and songs and I've got this gift of song all the time where I can't shut it off. And, to the point where I make everyone around me nuts. They're trying to talk to me about something serious and I'm sitting there tapping my foot. And they'll say to me, my wife or my daughter, they'll say, you're not listening, are you? And I'll say, no, <laughs> you know, cause I'm think cause I got a song in my head and that's kind of the living with Michael sweet. Um, and it's a good thing and it's a bad thing. Yeah. So. Well, that doesn't sound like a bad thing to me. Um, and, and you, we, we, you do mention the other players, so we'll get into, to that, uh, you've got Joel Hoekstra of White Snake on this. Will Hunt, uh, who's with Evanescence, and he's of course played with a band called Scrape. That's where I first got to know yeah, him. Yeah, and I yeah. think he also did stuff with Tommy Lee, if I'm not mistaken. He did stuff with Tommy Lee. He sat in briefly with Motley Crue on a few shows. Uh, he's at Black Label Society. Oh right, right, right. right. I, I mean, he's played with a ton of people. He because he's because he's that good. That's why he's in high demand because he's exceptional. And uh, John O'Boyle and Ethan Brosh on this as well. Yes, yes, and then and then uh, even um, not more important, but equally as important. There's a girl on here by the name of 15 year old girl named Mariah Formica. Yes, and I had uh, I did a show with her, and she blew me away so much. I invited her to be on my solo album. I just I wanted the world to hear, you know. So so before we we get into the sort of track by track thing. Um, where does that leave us with Sweet and Lynch? Where does it leave us with the next new Striper album and uh, sort of moving forward with those projects? Well, the plan is right now, I have to schedule everything out because, you know, thank God, things are so busy. And because of that, the touring and the recording and whatnot, I, I really got to plan in advance, sometimes a year in advance. And the Striper, the next Striper album and the next Sweet and Lynch album are planned out and actually put on the calendar right now for the January, February time slot of 2017. And my goal is to do them both roughly at the same time and just kind of go back and forth between the two. And the reason for that uh, are things like uh, I record at the same studio and use the same drum kit and maybe leave it set up save a little money and a little uh, setup time, uh, you know, have Rob track his drums and have whoever's playing on the album, Sweet Lynch album, track their drums. Hopefully it's Brian Tishy. Uh, but, you know, that's the goal. That's the goal right now. There's, there's Striper touring all the way up until the end of the year. Uh, next year, I definitely want to uh, do some solo touring and play some of these solo songs live with a really killer band. And I want to do some Sweet and Lynch touring as well. Uh, yeah, I talked would to be George, George about it. He's all into it as well. Yeah, that would that would be uh, that'd be great to do some shows with with George. Now, of course, he's got a a few docking things coming up. He does. He has has the dates over in Japan, and as far as I know, unless things change, you know, it's it's just kind of a one off situation. They don't plan to. A six-off uh, situation, right? They're doing a six-off, six yeah, <laughs> six-off situation. And I, God bless them. I think it's going to be awesome. You know, they were huge in Japan, and, and people are going to just love it. Um, you know, it, it, it's, I would love to see them work out their differences and go out and tour um, in America as well and, and do the real deal because, I mean, people dock in such a great band, iconic band, and, uh, you know, who knows? That could happen. Um, Hopefully it will. Uh, it, it, it may not, though. I don't know. But that being said, uh, we're going to, of course, find time to do Sweet and Lynch. We have to, especially doing a second album. Um, we got to make the time to do that. And I think people <coughs> people want to see it. Um, well, yeah, because they love the album. The, the reaction 
was fantastic. A lot of people put it on their best of 2015 list. So there's really no reason to not do it. Yeah, we got to do it. And there's a certain chemistry. You either have it or you don't. And I think George and I really had a, a, a great chemistry together. Uh, and we worked well together. And, you know, he sent me ideas and I uh, took those ideas and ran with them. And, and we were able to really create some great, uh, great music together. And I would love to do that again. And we're going to do it again. We, it's, we've, we've already talked about it. It's in the works. It's happening. Um, it's just a matter of when will it come out? I don't know. I'm guessing the end of 2017. It could be early part of 18. But uh, the goal is to record it early 17. Uh, I said the, I meant it wouldn't come out till the latter part of 17, if, if I didn't say that correctly. Right. Uh, but, man, George is obviously one of my favorite guitar players of all time, and it's an honor to work with the guy. No doubt. So I'm looking forward to that. And... Um... And last thing before we get into it, to getting track by track, you've got the To Hell with the Devil 30th Anniversary Tour, and of course, the return of the yellow and black costumes. Um, anything special for that in terms of getting back into the look? I mean, are you hitting the gym a lot more? Are you, are you dieting, or are you just going to go out there and say, it is what it is, man. Let's, let's do this and have some fun. Well, the good thing is with this band is we've always tried – you know, we've all put on a little little weight here and there over the years, but we've always tried hard <laughs> to stay in shape. Uh, and no disrespect to other bands, but if you if you look at Striper, you, you'll you'll kind of see what I mean. Um, we've we've worked hard to you know not just sound good, but to look good as well. So it, it wouldn't be uh, so hard for us to uh, fit right in or, or you know blend right in with those outfits and get into them. Um, without without issues, uh, you know the, the big the big issue is the hair. We we don't have the hair we used to have, nor do we want to go through the ritual we used to have to go through to make it big. So you know we'll just go out with the hair that we have, and um, you know. But the costumes are going to rock. They're the same costumes, uh, re remade and retailored, and we're going to do the album from start to finish. We're going to add some songs at the end. So it's not a 45 or 50 minute set. And, you know, what's interesting is we just went out and did like 20 shows. And I said at every single show what we're doing, when we're doing it, and who's coming. <laughs> and every hand in the place, I'm talking about 1,000 to 1,200 people every night, every hand in the place went up. So I think that those shows are going to be incredibly successful. People want to see that. Uh, and they want to hear that album. And we're excited about doing it, man. 30-year anniversary. It's crazy. Yeah, and it it always gets to me that these albums, because, you know, thousands and thousands of albums come out every year. Most are ignored, and here you are 30 years later, and people still love it. They still want to hear it. Um, just a testament, I guess, to the songwriting, the performance. Um, you know, you... you Everything. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. It, it, it does surprise me, and I, I always shake my head in a complete uh, shock. And um, and I don't know why. It's just it's just how I'm built. But it always surprises me when I walk out on stage every night, and I see people there. I'm surprised uh, because you know we should never take this for granted what we do as musicians. Because the music industry and the state of music is in such a volatile place, it's uh, it's scary, you know, in terms of nobody buying music anymore, and um, especially rock. Uh, it, it, our uh, dream can be wiped out at any time. You know, you could, you could walk out on stage and be playing to ten people when you know. Two years ago, you were playing to a thousand people, and many bands um, do. By the way, you know it's not it's not that unrealistic that it can all go away tomorrow morning. It's not. It's really not. It sounds odd to hear that, but I think it's very realistic, and that's why when we step out on stage on this last tour, we had more sellout shows than we've had since two thousand and three, and, and I mean almost every show sold out. We played Gas Monkey in Dallas. And we played to like uh, over 2,000 people. I don't recall pulling 2,000 people in Dallas over the past 20 years. 
uh, the numbers just went through the roof. And I think there's a reason for that. Striper has been a band that's been consistent. We work hard. We put out music regularly. We tour regularly. And we strive to make it the best that it can be all around. Well, so can, I, I think, can I suggest something, though? Sure. I, 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 that stuff is great, but I really think that the, the key is that you don't take advantage of your fan base. You don't just put out 18 greatest you know, greatest hits compilations. You don't just go through the motions on the stage. There's a real appreciation and connection with the fans and fans respond to that. You know, when you show up at a show and you can tell that they're just going through a 75 minute set because they want their check at the end of the night, you don't go back again, but that's not Striper. I think you're right. I think that's an absolute, incredibly valid point and important point. I think another important point is social media. We go out of our way, and not to pat myself on the shoulder here, but I really go out of my way to stay in contact with uh, with my fans and with all the fans out there, um, from Facebook Live to Periscope to tweeting constantly and Facebook. And, and people ask me, it's funny, a guy just recently asked me, or he actually said, ah, it's not really Michael Sweet, that's just someone, you know, someone else. And I responded, I said, no, that's me. And then people say, how do you have the time? There's no one behind a desk doing my Twitter and my Facebook feeds. And, you know, what's hilarious is when I follow people all the time, I won't name names, but I'll follow someone and you get that uh, generated response in your message box. Hey, thank you for following. Be sure to follow us at. And, and I know instantly that it's not the artist. And that's, <laughs> that, and that's disappointing. And that's what I mean about taking advantage of your fan base where you just sell them this nonsense is prefabricated and people just turn right. off on that and and right. that's not what striper does and that's not what you do especially because I, I do follow you on twitter and i see the exchanges sometimes it's blatantly honest where you somebody is calling you out on something and you say hey dude you know yeah and uh it's it's refreshing and i think that's what makes it um endearing and what makes it worth following and worth being a fan of is that you know, you realize that it's special to have these people that listen to "To Hell with the Devil" for thirty years, and you don't just go to hell with no. them. You know, and uh, you know, kudos for you for doing that, by the way. Well, man, look, I, again, I never take it for granted. I, I wound up moving back to Massachusetts in '95 and losing everything. You know, uh, Orange County went bankrupt, and that's where my house was. And I did a short sale, and we moved in with my mother-in-law, and. Uh, I worked for the family business and made, you know, uh, eight bucks an hour. And I did that for quite a few years. And um, <clears throat> as I was working out in the cranberry bogs every day, I was saying to myself, you know, if I ever, if I'm ever blessed with the opportunity to do this again, um, I'll never take it for granted ever. Yeah. And forgive me and forgive me, God, if I ever did. And I don't, it's important to me. And I, I respect and realize, uh, you know, how special the fans are to me. You know? Yeah, I get that. Now, sp- speaking of respect, I totally respect what you did with One Sided War. So, so let's talk about this album because it- it's going to end up on many, many best of 2016 lists. And I, and I don't mean that facetiously. I mean, it really is that good. It's-, it's just a great, great rock record. So track one, Bizarre. Uh, tell me the story of bizarre where does that come from is it is it referring to some kind of situation that's bizarre is life bizarre and and who's playing on that you know let me know which ones have joel on them and go absolutely on that on that song that's will will hunt obviously on on every song drumming um and john o'boyle on bass on every song and then that's myself on guitar and ethan brosh on guitar gotcha so uh and uh, the song itself lyrically is about how we make choices and many times in our society we make the wrong choice when we know what the right choice is and we don't seem to learn from our mistakes, you know, and it, it seems as though we put, uh, you know, negativity and uh, bad people who do bad things and say bad things on a pedestal. It's like the more bad they are, the more bad things that they say, it's almost like their popularity goes up. And to me, that's bizarre. 
I kind of scratch my head at that and think, how bizarre. And that's what the song's saying. You know, um, why do we do these things? Musically, it's, <clears throat> it's, it's kind of got a little bit of a Van Halen-y kind of vibe to it. I'm a big fan of Van Halen. I'm a big fan of David Lee Roth, his first and second album. And I, I love that, 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 you know, that fast tempo, high energy in your face, a la Van Halen style song musically. So that's kind of what it is. And it's just, everyone's just kind of going off and jamming. Um, and it hits you right between the eyes, you know, yeah, it really does. And speaking of David Lee Roth, I, how cool would it be to hear you cover Yankee Rose? I mean, <laughs> oh, dude, man, I, 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 I'm such a fan of, of that stuff such a fan and um you know i'm more of a roth guy than a hagar guy i love sammy hagar he's a better singer uh technically speaking but man i'm just i grew up with roth and uh you know i'm just such a huge fan uh i'd more important i'd love to uh get with roth in a room and work with him um and not that i'm a, a singing coach but i love to work with him on his voice because he still has it I, I think he still has it, but he he's kind of uh, trained himself to, uh, you know, for whatever reason, not do what he's capable of doing live. I hear him live, and I think, oh, man, you know, I know he can do this, and I know he can do that, and I love to work with him. But um, I love Roth, and I, lo- and I love Van Halen. Yeah, and how can you not? One of the, one of the greatest American bands ever, period. Um, track two, One-Sided War. What war are we talking about? What What is one-sided war trying to tell the people? <laughs> well, that initially started out, I'll be totally honest with you. I, I, I got into a, a bit of a war with uh, Nikki Six a, a while back. And, uh, you know, I, I, it made me think. And then later on, a, a, a slight war with Sebastian Bach. Um, and I just kind of thought, Looking online, you see all these people going at it recently, most recently, you know, Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley and um, – And Nikki Six with those two as well. Yeah, because what happens I think a lot of times is this big war breaks out and it goes public and viral and everyone's talking about it. And then all the other people uh, start jumping on board to try to get some publicity. That's my take on it. Um, well, of course. You know, I mean it's it's – that's what Twitter and, and Facebook are for is to – Get right. your name out there, and controversy yeah. sells. We know that. Yeah, so that's that. In my opinion, whatever, take it or leave it. That's why Nikki jumped all over that because he got some press. But uh, <clears throat> that being said, that's what the song's about. <clears throat> These one-sided wars where this one guy goes off and starts trashing someone else, and the other people are just sitting there going, "Wow, you pulled out your guns and you you started shooting me." For no reason at all, this is a one-sided war. And in the lyric, it decides to take the high road and say, look, you go ahead and you keep doing what you're doing and saying what you're saying and, and being the the low life that you are, whatever whatever term you want to put on it, because uh, it's not very nice. Um, and I'm just going to take the high road and keep being who I am. And, and, and at that point, it becomes a one-sided war, you know? Yeah. Um, and you just keep moving forward and doing your thing, and they keep doing their thing, shooting their arrows, you know, and and and, and their bullets at you. And that's what the song's about. Musically, um, it's a co-write with uh, an incredible writer uh, by the name of Blair Daly. He's written for Crew, uh, co-written for for Crew for Leonard Skinner. I mean, um, uh, the song "Smile" Uncle Cracker. He he co-wrote that. I mean, he's he's had numerous number ones, and he's a super great guy, good friend. Uh, and, and, and an incredible writer, and we co-wrote that song together. So that was a, a real honor for me to, to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, l- let me see here. All right, let me let me just go with the third track. I was going to ask you another question, but I'll go with the third track. Can't take this life. Um, another great one. Now, which, which ones do jo- does Joel play on? Uh, uh, Joel is playing on. He's doing the solos on three songs, and those songs are Radio, Who Am I, and One Way Up. Ah, okay, so they're, so they're coming up in the rotation. So let, let's get with Can't Take This Life. Um, what is that one about? I mean, obviously it's a um, 
sort of a life affirming song in a, in a sense that you got to keep going, no? Or, or what are we trying to say? Exactly. You know how many times someone can say something very hurtful to you or do something very hurtful to you? And depending upon who we are and how strong we are, if, if we're not so strong, we can let that completely destroy our lives. So in essence, it's taking your life. Yes, and, 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 and a lot of people, by the way, I find do that. You, you know, we live in this world of perceptions, and somebody will say something, and you'll start going through all these machinations in your head. Exactly. And, and, and it has absolutely nothing to what, you know, sometimes it's just an innocent comment, and you've turned it into this whole right. thing while the other person has moved on with their lives. So, okay, so that, that's, that is can't take this life. Um, musically, again, another, another fast one, right? Yeah, it's a real, that's just, you know, I wanted that song to be all about metal. Just the, you know, that, that pounding groove and, and riff in your face. Um, and just a straight ahead metal tune. Um, you know, I, I didn't, another thing a lot of people ask me is, hey man, are there screams? Are there screams on the album? Are there screams on the album? And I find it so funny that uh, in many ways, that's what I'm known for. <laughs> are those high pitched screams and as I get older it's a little harder to do those, you know? Uh so I threw I threw one in on that on that song. Uh I I didn't want to do too many on this album. So there are screams uh selectively throughout the album and obviously on that song because it's fitting. Uh but man that song's just all about bringing the metal and um and just hitting people hitting people with it man and making people go wow this is heavy. This is cool. But yet it's still very melodic at the same time. Yeah, in fact, that's what I noticed, that you do strike a nice balance because I, I'm more, listen, I'll, I'll, be, I'll admit it, I'm more of a melodic rock guy. I cover a lot of metal, but I, I just don't sometimes get black metal and death metal yeah. and this metal and that. Uh, you know, I like Van Halen where they turn it up. I, I like early Def Leppard where they turn, I like that kind of stuff, but there's, there's, you know, Metallica on the Black Album, they balanced melody and heavy riffing and, and you know, that's, that's the way to go. I agree with you, man, one million percent. I mean, I, I don't get it either. A, a lot of the, the new bands, and as you said, black metal and uh, you know, the, death the, metal the, and yeah, yeah, the death metal and the scream. Blah, 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 blah. It's like, you know, I just, I'm sitting there going, man, I just don't get it. And then I feel old. I, I feel like my grandparents, you know, who, who, who didn't get the heaviness of, uh, of, you know, the music at, in my time. Uh, and, and I think, am I getting old here? And it's like, no, I, I'm, I think music is, uh, translated to melody and vice versa. Uh, if you don't have melody, it's not music. That's just, that's just my opinion, but I think it's certainly an important uh, opinion and, and an important point of view. It, it's, it's, it's important to have both. You got to have melody to have music. You got to have music to have melody. And it's like these bands that don't have the melody, uh, they're, Sadly, mis- misguided, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I-, I fully agree with you. I think I think melody is sort of the base of it all. Because, and even bands that are outside the genre, whether you listen to like a Dead Can Dance or Bjork or something, where they're doing sometimes all these syncopated rhythms, and you just right. go, what, what, "What is this? Where where's the thing I can <laughs> tap along to? I need to tap along to it." You know, it's uh, true. It's so true, and uh, that's what moves people. That is what moves people, and, and where you can sit there and tap your foot, and and you and you can feel it, your body can feel it, and your mind can feel it, and your heart can feel it. And same thing with lyrics. You know, I, I read somewhere recently that lyrically, uh, that's why in country music, you know, they did a mashup of like five or six or seven country songs, and they all sounded the same. There's a method to that madness, and there's a reason for that because that's what people want to hear. They want to hear the same groove where they can tap their foot, and they want to hear the same lyric that's not too deep that they can relate to about pickup trucks and beer and girls. It, you know, that's that's who we are, and that's what we want. You know, we want the simplicity of just a good a good song and and a good melody, and, and that's just the way it is. And that, I don't think that's ever going to change. I really don't. No, and well, okay. Well, so let me ask you about lyrically, though. 
because I'm a big fan of Kiss, and lyrically, lyrically, they've never said anything super deep. You know, I want to rock and roll all night is not, you know, Nietzsche. But right. I, th- but that's what I want to hear. I don't want a whole story and something telling me about how miserable my life is. And <laughs> Right? So are, are you aware of that lyrically, or do you need to say something deeper than just... You know. No, I agree. I I hear you, man. I mean, Striper's always been a a band lyrically, obviously, that does something totally different, and you either get it, <laughs> you either get it or you don't. But I I hear exactly what you're saying. Uh, there is something to be said for the simplicity of a lyric, uh, and you start getting too deep, and especially if you get too deep and too dark, you know, that's what I don't relate to. Is is some of the lyrics that are just so dark and so depressing. Yeah. Uh, you're just thinking, God, man. It, what's wrong with this person who wrote this song? Are they really that miserable? Well, obviously so. And, and then it's, what's really sad is you, 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 you see the thousands upon thousands of people who buy it, who are just as depressed. <laughs> you know? no, exactly. You know, listen, I, I'm going to show my age a bit, but when, when we came into the seventies after Vietnam and all that, a lot of the music was about those things, and they were telling stories where it was like reading a book almost. And it was like, right? It's like I'm listening to this because I want to forget that. Right. I don't need that on my headphones. Go, you know, go away. And um, right, you know, I uh, know. Uh, radio. I hear you. Let, let's go to radio track number four because, um, hey, uh, what is radio about? And this is where we get Joel Hoekstra, so we know that it's extra good. <laughs> that is Joel. Joel's playing the guitar solo on that song and doing some overdub work. He's doing the little banjo work on that. He just killed it. You know, he, he took it to a whole new level, man. When I when I heard what he did, I was like, wow, dude. I called him and said, you got to be kidding me. Um, what that song is about, it speaks to me first before anybody else. Because I've tried it and I've gone down that road, but I have also have a reason for going down that road, and I'll explain later. But it speaks to the Steven Tyler's. It speaks to the um, uh, oh gosh, who else? Who else has gone to Nashville and tried to go country? Brett Michaels. Uh, he, Brett, thank you, Brett Michaels. I mean, there's a there's a list that's quite extensive, quite long, of the guys that are rock and roll dudes. You've always seen them as that, known them as that, and that's who they are, who go to Nashville and try to be country guys and put on the cowboy hat, and all of a sudden they're country. And, you know, it's kind of funny because, again, I did it. I, I, I've written some country-ish songs over the years. On my last solo album, I had a song called Coming Home in the video. I'm wearing a cowboy hat. I grew up around country. My dad wrote a number one country song in 1978. I, I literally grew up in country music. I played on my dad's country sessions when I was a kid. But regardless of that, I'm a rock dude. I'm not a country guy. So I'm never going to go to Nashville and put on cowboy boots and a cowboy hat and try to be country. I might do some co-writing with people and blah, blah, blah. But I just find it always a little, a little comical to see guys doing that. I think recently there was some thrash metal guy or – real hardcore metal guy who went to Nashville and he's trying to be country. And I'm just thinking, okay, that's interesting. The song radio is a parody of that. It's supposed to be funny. It's it, The lyrics are talking about how hey, I'm going to go to Nashville and I'm going to write a country song. It won't be long till I'm on the radio. And when it goes to number one, I'm going to fake the fun like a clown in a rodeo. You know? And in the video, we have a video for that that's coming out. It's hilarious. Oh, it's really, really funny. Uh, and the song is supposed to be funny. You're supposed to laugh at it when you listen to the lyric, and especially when you watch the video, you're supposed to laugh. I'm hoping it'll make a lot of people laugh. Yeah, I can't, I can't wait to see that. And now, will, will Joel, uh, Joel be in the video? Let's hope. Joel is in the video. Todd Kearns is in the video. Ah, uh, yes, from um, Slash's band. From Slash's band in Sin City Sinners, and um, I, I love Todd. Age, uh, Age of Electric, I think, is his Canadian band. Yes, yes, I, I love Todd. I, I'm very impressed with Todd as a person, and I'm, I'm impressed with him as a as a player and as a singer. Obviously, uh, I would love to someday tour and do some shows with Todd. I, I just think he's fantastic, and he was gracious enough to join me in the video. 
Uh, he lives out in Vegas, and uh, we've become friends, and he's in the video along with Joel. And then I've also got Scott Coogan, because Will Hunt, who's the drummer on the album, who was supposed to be in the videos, he went through a, a situation where he was not able to make it. Uh, he had to step aside <coughs> and bow out, and I had to uh, call upon Scott. I didn't have to, but I, I'm just saying I, I but, called but upon Scott. But Scott's a good choice. I mean, he's played with Ace Fraley and I believe Brides of Destruction. So He's a great choice, and I love Scott. He's such a sweetheart and, and a great drummer and a killer singer. I mean, talented dude, and I love him. He's in the video as well. So um, really cool lineup. Very fun, very fun song. Uh, you know, the song's totally different than uh, the, the first three songs that you hear. And um, it's all about the riff. And it's a very mid, mid-paced, uh, you know, really catchy, fun kind of lyric. And I can't wait for people to hear that, man. I really can't. Yeah, no, that's a great one. Uh, Golden Age. Um... You know, as I get older, that that sounds like you're talking about me at a buffet at three in the afternoon. <laughs> but <laughs> but what what is Golden Age about? Because uh, I mean, obviously, the Golden Age of rock for me was the '80s. But what is this song actually about? Well, that song that song is a little bit more in line with my faith, um, and you know, you know, people. It, it, the thing that I feel uh, that people don't do enough of. Is, is pray. And, and, you know, I'm always mentioning that on Twitter and stuff. And yeah, people who don't believe in uh, the God that I believe in or don't believe in the, in the Christian faith, uh, obviously they, they have a different way of thinking and a different way of living. And that's fine. But, you know, I'm all about, as you know, of course, I'm all about my faith and I'm all about, you know, encouraging people uh, to pray and believe, and and that's kind of what that song's about. Um, you know, it's 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 really not a double meaning song, or it's 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 a straightforward lyric. Uh, and when you sit down and you read them, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, powerful song, musically, it's metal all the way, man. I love the breakdown in the song. Uh, I'm a big fan of Priest. It's got a little bit of a Priest vibe at times. Um, and it's probably one of my favorite bands of all time. And you're going to hear that come out in my songwriting from time to time, for sure. Yeah. Uh, you can't deny priest that that's, that's the way to go. Only you track six. Um, who are we talking about? Okay. Only you is it, just a straight ahead love song. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's just a, a lyric about, you know, I'm, when I wrote that song, you know, obviously I'm thinking about my wife, you know, and how she makes me feel. And it, it's only her, it's only you, babe, you know, who makes me feel this way. Uh, so uh, the world revolves around love, or at least it should. Uh, and you can never go wrong with a love song, ever, in my opinion. Musically speaking, uh, it's it's really cool. Oh, no, I want to mention, too, that's a co-write as well. There are only two co-writes on the album. One is uh, One Sided War, which is Blair Daly and I. This song is a co-write as well with uh, another writer out of Nashville, a really great, talented, incredible writer by the name of Bruce Wallace. And we co-wrote that song together. I walked in with that riff. That's all about the Van Halen, that song. You know, you know it's got that uh, a little bit of that Van Halen-y kind of vibe to it. And... Um, I just love Van Halen, man. That's going to come out, too, in, in some of the ideas that I create and come up with. On that song, we've got the one and only Mr. Ethan Brosh playing the, the solo. Right. So all the, guitar, all the guitar soloing, that's Ethan. And Ethan's just amazing. He's a local guy here in Massachusetts. Awesome player. Fantastic, man. And he reminds me of George Lynch meets... Warren Demartini meets, you know, you throw in maybe a little Ingve in there and Steve Vai in there. He's such a unique player, man. I love his playing, and he's on that tune. Yeah, that's great, and and, and it's great that you mentioned Warren because he he gets left off the sort of guitar god list uh, a lot, and it's it's such a pity because the stuff he did with Rad is just so bloody good. You know, Warren's one of the best players that come out of the eighties. I mean, if yeah, it, and, my and yet top... he gets ignored a lot. You, you, you know. I know. Well, I mean, 
It could be, I'm just throwing this out there, it could be because of all the turmoil and rat and they're on and off, on and off, and not as consistent as other bands in terms of continuing touring and, and recording. But I agree with you. Uh, he's he's on my top 10 guitar list of guitar, uh, quote unquote, gods from the 80s. Uh, absolutely. He, he and George, both. Yeah, you, th- there's a guy that you'll need to, to work with at some point, too. Now... Track seven and eight, I, I love it because there's a there's this great juxtaposition. And in fact, you probably should have reversed the track words on this one. You have track seven, which is I am, and then the other one is Who Am I? <laughs> right? So track You're yeah. right. Who am I? And then I am. <laughs> right. That that probably would have been the better the better way. No, but uh so <laughs> I am. What what are you? Uh, I am is straight ahead uh, lyrically. Uh, that, that that's God speaking, man. I mean, God is the great I am, and if you if you read the Bible, you'll you you'll you'll get that, and you'll know that, and and that's one of His many names. I am the great I am, so that's what that song's speaking about lyrically, musically. Uh, it, it's every bit as bold and every bit as powerful. I mean, it's uh, I sent that over to, or the label sent it over to people in Japan and uh, in Europe. Uh, for licensing, and, and uh, one of the comments that came back was, wow, it sounds like Dio, you know, that track. I, I never really thought of it that way, but that's what they said, and that's what they thought, and hey, I'll take that. Um, I love Dio, but, you know, it's just the powerful, in-your-face track, man. Uh, it, it's it's real meaty, real riffy, and uh, it, it no holds barred whatsoever on that well, song, yeah. lyrically or musically. And that's pretty much the whole album. And and when, by the way, when somebody says you sound like Dio, that is never uh, to be taken wrong. <laughs> that's like the ultimate compliment, right? Oh man, yeah, of course. And I grew up with Dio, one of my all-time favorite singers. I sound nothing like Dio <laughs> at all, but I love Dio. And um, I mean, there's there's no one like him, nor will there ever be. Yeah, and musically, what what the band and the different formations did with that band is just oh, yeah. killer. Unreal. Now, now after finding out who I am, you have to question everything and say, "Who am I?" Um, yes, yeah, so who, who are you? Well, that that's a that's a ballad again, a love song. It's it's someone crying out, uh, saying, "Who am I to take our love for granted? Uh, you know, who who am I to treat you like this? Who am I to do this to you?" And and that's what that song's about, an apologetic song. Uh, I'm sorry, you know, for, for what I do and what I put you through, and, and who am I to do that? Uh, musically, it's it's a ballad. It's the only ballad on the album, but it's a rock ballad. It's not a piano ballad. It's a guitar ballad. And it, it kind of takes me back in some ways to the White Snake uh, days, especially the guitar solo, and because obviously we have the one and only Joe Holkstra on that song again. Uh, and I told him that. I said, dude, think White Snake on this. And he opens with it, Duh! you know, that sustaining White Snake kind of is this love kind of riff. And Joe just killed it on that song, man. It's one of my favorite guitar solos on the album, for sure. He's, he's absolutely. Uh... He's he's just a great guitar player, and and I think he's going to be doing Trans Siberian Orchestra again this year. And uh, oh, you got to love Joel. Um, talent. He, he's he's scary talented. Joel Joel is just effortless. When you watch him play, uh, it, it's like it's no big deal to him. It's like you know eating a bowl of cereal or or something yeah. or drinking a cup of coffee. It's just there's no effort because uh, it's so easy for him. And it's so incredibly great and literally from somewhere else. There aren't very many people that play like Joel. Uh, and what's great about Joel is he's, uh, he, he, he's bringing back that style of playing. Uh, you know, the, the great guitar solos from the 70s and the 80s, Joel is that guy. He really is. Now, when you say that the song is somewhat apologetic or... Is it based on a real life situation where you felt the need to put it in in song that I'm sorry, you know, I'm sorry, babe, I'm oh, sorry, yeah. fan? Okay, absolutely. I mean, I, I I love my wife to death, but at the same time, because of my personality, I get really intense. I get really stressed out. You know, she and I uh, basically 
uh, co-manage the band, Striper. And we deal with all the stuff and all the muck and, and all the stuff that takes place out on the road. So she and I are on the phone every day, and it gets intense sometimes. And, and sometimes I'm not so nice to my wife. And I feel terrible for for that, and I always apologize to her and whatnot. But, you know, there's nothing like, as a songwriter, being able to write a song and say, Honey, this song is for you. Uh, please forgive me. Accept my apologies. So absolutely, that comes from my heart and goes out to my wife, for sure. Yeah, that's uh, – wow. Um, you make me one, and I don't mean to, to, to discount what you just said, but uh, I do know you have an interview coming up soon. So uh, you make me one. You make me want to what? Rock? <laughs> you make me want to hmm. Um, <laughs> exactly. it, it, it's kind of like it's kind of like put whatever word you want in there. <laughs> uh, but you know th that was one of those fun songs lyrically. Uh, it kind of like what you were talking about. You know the Kiss lyrics. You know it, you don't want lyrics about war or this or that. You just want just lyrics about you know that that make me feel good and, and make me want to have fun. And that's what that song is lyrically. Um, you make me want to move. You make me want to groove. You make me want to, you know. Uh, and musically speaking, that song, is, it's really funny because when we were doing that song, I don't know why I kept saying to the engineer, this kind of reminds me of Kiss a little bit. And it, there's just something that, don't, don't, I, don't, don't, I don't know why. It just did. It, it, took, me to, it, it took me to the Kiss days growing up. Uh, that simplicity of just that groove and getting in your head and getting under your skin. Uh, musically, and, you know, straight ahead as could be. And I didn't want that song to be anything else than that, anything other than that. Yeah, nice, nice and simple is the way we like it. We don't want, we, you know, we don't need, to, in fact, it brings us to song 10, Comfort Zone. I like songs that are in my comfort zone that are nice <laughs> and simple and, you know. Um, what comfort zone are we talking about? Oh man! Well, you know, lyrically, it, it's we all get to a place where we're in a comfort zone where it, it keeps us from trying new things because we're comfortable, you know, and we don't want to take chances or take risk because we're comfortable. Uh, and I've thought that and said that to myself many times, but it's important that we step out of our comfort zone and we try new things and take chances because when we do that. We look back a year or two later and we realize what came from it, which is usually greatness. You know, I stepped out of my comfort zone when I joined Boston. My wife was sick with cancer at the time. Uh, I had no idea how I was going to go out and tour with Boston and leave her at home uh, at that time. And she really encouraged me to do so, and I did so. And... Um, you know, I look back on it now, and I'm glad that I did. I'm glad that I stepped out of that zone and, and, and went out and did that because there were many reasons why I was there and why I was supposed to be there. Um, so, you know, that's what I'm talking about. We need to break that mold and step out of our comfort zone in order to experience more and, uh, you know, sometimes some of the best things in our lives. In fact, let me ask you about that Boston thing real real quick as an aside uh, speaking of your comfort zone, getting out of it, how was it getting on stage and singing somebody else's songs, performing? Because, you know, you've done Striper, you've done the Michael Sweet. You've always been doing your stuff. How how was that as an experience for you to do other people's stuff? Was it as rewarding? Was it a learning experience? Was it like, oh, my God, I can't wait to get back to Striper. What am I doing here? How was it? No, it was great. I mean, at that time, obviously, honestly, um, I, I was kind of burnt on the striper thing. Um, and uh, it was refreshing uh, to go out and do something different. Uh, and I needed it. Uh, and, and standing on stage singing Boston songs every night was so surreal. And I've often said, pinch me moments every night. And it really was because it, it, it felt and seemed like a dream. Um, because here I am, one of my all-time favorite albums that I grew up with that really shaped me as a musician. And I'm standing on stage next to Tom Scholl singing the songs. And it was just, it was just weird in a great way. Um, so it was a lot of pressure. I mean, when I first stepped into that gig, I had the pressure uh, subconsciously of filling the shoes of Brad Delp. And when I realized I'm never going to fill his shoes, nor would I ever want to, uh, I was able to release that 
and just be me. And Tom allowed me to be me. And then I just had fun. And then the fans accepted me and realized I was having fun. And, and, and I, it caused them to have more fun. And we were all just celebrating uh, the life of Brad Delp during that tour. So it was really, really incredible to do. Would you ever consider working with them again or, or any other band? Like, you know, uh, let's say Styx calls you up or, or Journey. Or, would you work with anybody else or you sort of you've been there, done that, and now it's time for Michael and Striper? You know, it would depend on the circumstances and the timing of it. Okay. So, so in other words, Striper's getting ready to embark on a To Hell with the Devil tour. If I got a phone call from, uh, you know, Journey or, or yeah. Sticks saying, hey, will you go out with us in September instead of Striper? I would say no. Right. You know, I'm, I'm very loyal and I, I you know, I, I want to handle things the correct way. But at the same time, if Striper's off, which when I, when I toured with Boston, Striper was off on a, on a down year, um, you know, I, I would consider it. I mean, if it was if it felt right, it felt right to do Boston. It was difficult uh, because of the circumstances at home, but it felt right. If I got a call from, you know, Van Halen uh, to go sing for Van Halen or whatever, and if it was if the right circumstances, I would I absolutely do it. Uh, and there are only a, cer- a certain number of bands that I would do that for. Van Halen's one of them. Uh, Journey, I couldn't sing Journey songs. I mean, I could certainly go play with Journey and sing background vocals and maybe sing a song or two, but I couldn't do what Arnell does or what Dean uh, Castronovo did. There, there's no way. I don't have that kind of a voice. Uh, but, you know, uh, other bands, Sticks, I could do. And I was talking to um, to J.Y., backstage on the Boston tour. And he told me I was on the list of singers that they wanted to audition. Really? For... Yeah, he did. He told me that. And uh, that surprised me. Uh, but I, because, I mean, I, I've been told that I sound like Dennis DeYoung at times, you know? Um, and, and when I sing those songs, it's kind of scary, actually. That's uh, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to picture that though. The, you singing for Van Halen has got me a lot more excited. That would be, that would really be something. I think you could add such a a layer to those songs that would be great. And you could, of course, handle the catalog in full. Um, I could, I could, I could handle the full catalog. I mean, I might have a little difficulty with some of the Sammy songs, uh, but but I could sing them, absolutely. And you know, the thing about it is, I'm a I'm 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 a huge Van Halen fan. I know the material. I know the inflections. Like Striper, if you go on YouTube and watch us doing "Ain't Talking About Love," you know, I, I can do the David Lee Roth stuff and, and 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 hit all the inflections and hit the notes and and totally pull it off. Um, I could run around on stage. I'm I'm still in in decent shape and uh, entertain the crowd and get get them into it uh, and fit right in. I think um, I think it would be a match made in heaven. No pun intended. But, uh, you know, they've got David. If they ever decide to take on a new singer, uh, maybe they would give me a call, and, and maybe I would do it. Right. <laughs> your, your, your hand is up just in case. I, I'm just, you know, just imagine <laughs> Eddie Van Halen soloing behind your vocals. I mean, how, how mind-blowing would that be? Maybe, if it, not in Van Halen, maybe the next solo album. That would be an even bigger pinch-me moment than uh, singing for Boston. Yeah, uh, to be really honest. Uh, well, in fact, that, that leads us to track 11, One Way Up. I guess Van Halen would be sort of one way up from, from Boston. No, no disrespect meant to Boston, obviously. Great band. But yep. uh, what what is One Way Up about lyrically and musically? Just another pedal to the metal kind of thing. That song talks about me, obviously, as a kid. And, uh, you know, uh, when I was younger, making some bad choices and then how I turned my life around. Uh, and, and that's that's what the lyric uh, basically uh, talks about, and and when, when it gets to the chorus, how you know in my life how I chose to take the the higher road and and, and go down a different path, um, and obviously incorporating my my beliefs and my faith into that song without being too preachy or or anything. Musically speaking, it's a straight up uh, rock and roll. You mentioned earlier you like straight up uh, rock kind of stuff versus the real hardcore metal kind of stuff. That that's more probably your type of song. It's kind of ACDC ish meets uh, whoever. Uh, a little more classic guitar sound, straight ahead groove. 
and then I've got, uh, again, Joel Holkstra playing on that, who killed it as well. Uh, and it's just a fun song, man. It's, it's a fun, I hate to use the word party, but it's kind of a, just a fun party song. And it makes you want to lift your glass up and say, yeah! You know, uh, nothing wrong with a, with a party song. I think Motley Crue built quite a good little career on party songs, so... Absolutely, and that's uh, that's Michael Sweet's party song right there, man. That's for all the all those fans out there that love that style of music. There it is. You know, as I've listened to the description of all these songs, it seems that there's a theme that comes through that you you were in somewhat of a pensive or a reflective kind of mood. Is that sort of what the, the collections of songs are? Just sort of a reflection of life and where you sort of fit in and and. You know, because you know, who am I to 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 do this to my wife? And one way up, look at me when I was a kid. And and is that sort of where we, where we went with this? Absolutely, and I think still where I am. Uh, you know, I'm always reflecting, uh, especially recently, uh, on myself and and uh, trying to do good and trying to make the right decisions. And unfortunately, many times because of my own stupidity and ignorance, uh, I make the uh, the wrong decisions and make poor choices. Uh, you know, like for example, being out on the road and, and, and trying hard to be level headed and being kind of the co tour manager out there, and then things get too intense, and then I kind of blow it, you know, and drop an F bomb or whatever, and everyone's just kind of sitting there going, whoa. <laughs> and then I, and then later on in the day, I say to myself, damn it, you know, I'm sorry. I, I got to be it. better than that, right? A- exactly. Because I'm only human, you know. Michael Sweet's not a perfect guy, and 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 don't for one second think that I am, or think that my life is perfect. And you know, I don't swear, or I don't do this, or I don't get angry or that. I mean, I'm just a regular guy. But I strive to be better, and uh, that's what I've been writing about lately. And, and I and I think that's a a common theme with most people. I, I think most of us try to be better. We don't want to just be. You know, what we were when we were 15 or 12 or, you know. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Let me get to song 12 because we've got, we've got the bonus track, which is Can't Take This Life, which we, of course, had earlier in the album, but this time with Mariah Formica singing on it, the 15-year-old that you mentioned. Um, talk to me about doing that bonus track and having her come in and, and I guess, help you on Not help you on it, but, you know, uh, be on it with you. Well, I did a show with Mariah. The first time I ever saw her perform uh, in New York, a uh, small place and uh, called Chrome. And uh, I was backstage, you know, doing my pre-show ritualistic uh, uh, whatever. And uh, I heard her singing. And I came out of the dressing room in the hallway, and I'm watching her. And I went back in, and I heard her singing again. I came out. She was doing uh, Ann Wilson, you know, Heart. She was doing uh, Lizzie Borden, excuse me, uh, doing uh, Lizzie Hale, Hailstorm, not Lizzie Borden. Right, because Lizzie and, Borden uh, <laughs> would be a little bit challenging, I think. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, uh, that's the thing that struck me with her is nothing was challenging. It, it kind of blew my mind. Uh, she, was, she did uh, uh, Skid Row, uh, you know, and, and, and I'm just sitting there thinking to myself, who is this kid? Then I found out she was 15 years old, and then my mind was even more blown. So uh, my wife and I really hit it off with her and her parents, and we exchanged information. And my wife had suggested the possibility of having her sing with me at some point, and I decided, you know, I'm going to have her on my album. And as she sang on that song, and you know, I just wanted the world to hear her, man. Uh, We had her up recently at a Striper show. She came up and sang To Hell with the Devil. And she's this little 15-year-old kid. She plays guitar. You should hear her play guitar. I mean, she's a shredder. She solos and, you know, <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, and I think the world's going to be hearing a lot more from her in the very near future. A uh, very talented kid and a sweet kid at that. And uh, I'm so impressed with her. And, and I'm glad that you gave her a platform. That's, that, that's, that's great, you know. As as a fifteen year old, I would have loved to have been on a Michael Sweet album or on a Striper <laughs> album. Or um, since we're talking about bonus tracks, obviously there are different markets around the world: Europe, Japan. A lot of them have bonus tracks. Are we at twelve? Period. End of story. Or 
will the Japanese get track number 13? Will Europe get track number 14, you know? Yeah, there there is a track 13. Okay, what's and, it called? And, uh, and, and, and yet, you know what? I'm going to actually go over to my computer so I can give you, and this is, this is really making me feel like an idiot here because I can't remember the name of it. Um, I'm going to go to my computer and look at it. But the the country that's getting that track, unless I am misinformed, is Japan. Because right, the Japanese always get a bonus track. It's 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 sort of grandfathered into the way they do business over there because of uh, you know in the early days the to buy an import from the states was cheaper than buying the domestic release, and so they tried to spur people to buy the domestic by adding bonus tracks. That's Exactly, so and I mean, always it, ask me about the history, you know. Yeah, and it was on. It was on, uh, and I'm looking right now. It was on the. Um, okay, it's called not to be. Not to be, and it's a. It's a mid-tempo, uh, riffy rock tune, and it's got a really killer breakdown. Uh, people will love that song, and uh, we just felt that that was the perfect choice to offer as a bonus track for Japan. Uh, it just seemed to be the one that the label and I agreed on. It's like, okay, done. That's the one. Uh, let me ask you about uh, Japan in terms of release date, because I, I actually buy Japanese releases, and I tried to buy One Sided War on pre-order from CD Japan and HMV Japan, they're not oh, list- yeah. they're not listing it yet. Is it something really? that's coming? Yeah, so maybe it's it's too early because it's just July, or is it coming out in September or in October in Japan? Or that's I- a good question. I I could certainly find out, uh, but I know this that we were late in the game getting and securing licensing deals in Japan and in Europe. So that's something that just happened recently. So maybe that's why I, I'm guessing that it'll come out in Japan uh, prior <laughs> to the release here. It might just be days or a week, uh, but I think you're going to see it at any at any given time uh, going up and, and being available. Good, good, good. Because I'm, I am, I, I do have the songs right now. I've got all twelve of them. I could say thank you very much, but. That's not what it means to be a fan, and that's not what it means to support your bands. You 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 got to get out there and and get to the shows and and get the CDs or whatever the downloads, whatever you want. But but you gotta you gotta open the wallet once in a while. I know, man, and you know the the the, the thing that's that's frightening for all musicians these days because the labels get paid, but the musicians really don't. Is the streaming situation, uh, and that seems to be obviously what everyone's doing now. Um, And, and, you know, it's like, where do we go from there? I I don't know. Uh, It's very interesting where we're at in terms of producers of music. Bands that uh, produce their music and release their music. It's like, where do we go from here? When you release, you you know, the the worry for me five years ago was, hey, we're recording 12 songs and then people are only downloading one or two. Right. And, And I'm just thinking, God, this just sucks. And we put all that effort into the other 10 and they're not downloading them because they pick and choose their favorites and make a decision on what they like or don't like. And it's not like the old days anymore. And then now you have streaming. So people aren't even downloading as much anymore. They're just streaming it. Uh, and then what's after that? Well, I don't know. Yeah. And, and, you know, in terms of streaming, there, there there's two things I, I always try to, to bring up is – the deals that are in place for a lot of bands didn't include that technology. So, there, so there's bad deals, and so I think what we're going right. to see moving forward is artists are now going to be aware and are going to say, no, 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 you're not paying right. me a penny per play. That's not going to happen. So I think exactly. better deals are going to change things for the artists. And you know, in terms of where do we go from here with, with streaming – it's tough, but the one good thing about streaming, though, is that it brings it back to people are listening to albums, and you can go find that rare gem. You know, you know, uh, you, you listen to like "Season of Wither" by Aerosmith. That wasn't a single, but people love right. it because they sat down and they listened to the album. And so, I think, I think album rock, where people are listening to full albums, is is going to come back thanks to streaming. And uh, 
Maybe yeah. the solution is for some really strange, rare solar burst that will only take out computers. Will will uh, take us back to the to the the, the golden age. <laughs> Track number five. No, but listen, I, I think we are sort of back in the golden age in the sense that bands like Striper have to get out there on the road and bring the music live. Yes. And that's what it was in the 1960s and 1970s. You know, the whole thing that blew up in the 80s really was more rare than it was yeah. norm. Uh, because I know. 50s and 60s, it was about shaking your bonbon on stage. And we're back to that. And I'm glad that we're back to that. So Absolutely. And we're, we're out doing it, man, as much as we can. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm hoping and praying, uh, Lord willing, that we can go another 32 years. Uh, that would put me at the age of 85. Uh, not bad. So I mean, that my, would... my dad's 86. So There you go. And if I figure if we eat right and take care of ourselves, and as I said, Lord willing, maybe we could go out there uh, in, our, in our yellow and black wheelchairs or canes or whatnot and, and do some jamming. Hey, why not? I mean, listen, Chuck Berry was playing, B.B. Uh, King. A lot of guys did it until they couldn't do it. So Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. I, let, let's keep going. There's, there's no reason to have a retirement tour or a farewell tour. Bands don't <laughs> retire. Striper doesn't retire. Michael Sweet, you're not allowed to retire. I'm just I'm telling oh, you. Oh, didn't you know, didn't you know this, this tour, To Hell with the Devil, is a farewell tour, and then we're coming back next year. You didn't know that? <laughs> yeah, with... Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, what was that album again? Uh, was it Against the Law? Is that the one? The the Against the Law album tour. The Against the Law album. Yep, yep. I'm looking forward to that one. That that'll that'll <laughs> that'll be great. Uh, keep that one for the cruises. I think. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> I kid. Uh, one sided war out in August. It is a great great album. I have actually listened to it. I'm not just blowing smoke up people's behinds. Um, buy it, folks. Pay for it. Michael, always a pleasure. Hey, brother, likewise. And, and listen, man, I hope it keeps growing on you. Keep listening to it. Let me know what your favorites are as we as we uh, talk on Facebook. And, man, uh, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you, man, and what you do, and I'm very happy for you. All right? Thank you, sir. And, uh, yeah, and there we go. We'll, we'll do All another right, one. Then. We'll do another one uh, in, in a couple of months. Okay, brother. Hey, be good. Absolutely. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And there you have it, folks, my interview with Michael Sweet of the band Striper. The new album is One-Sided War. I've had a chance to hear it and is absolutely phenomenal. You must, must check that out. Please also check me out on Twitter at Mitch Lafon, one-on-one Mitch Lafon on Facebook. And if you have any propensity to want to support the podcast, I do have a new paypal.me forward slash Mitch Lafon direct link to uh, offer some help for the podcast and bring you more Wonderful, wonderful interviews. But there you go. With that, uh, bye for now, and um, see you next time. Oh, my.